Hello, Uchelu Kutepa is my name. Uh, I was so excited when I saw that this message about uh, the Triple H Sunday uh, and um, asking me to essentially just send in um, this video. Uh, I count it a great privilege to do that. Um, that is someone I have received from for so many years and I've been blessed by. Uh, so I'll just say a few things. Uh, I hope you're having a great Sunday morning, by the way. Uh, I really do hope you are having one. Uh, well, you must have one when you're in the presence of the Lord, and particularly um, one that the true presence of the Lord is present. <laughs> okay, so um, what I like the modern pitfalls uh, to relationships today when we want to talk about contemporary issues. You know, the things that our parents confronted are quite different from the things we confront today. You know, some time ago I was having a conversation with daddy and he told me about making long trips back in the day and you read and sleep and think and read and sleep and think. Just imagine today taking a trip from Abuja to Lagos by road and having no phones in your hands or having a phone that is not data enabled. I can relate with such reality because um, I'm out here in the U.S. at the moment and going through some real harsh realities, very harsh realities. Now, you may not take it to be that way, but I am a family person, a people person. I'm not used to being alone. I'm quite alone here. I've been alone here for some time where I am staying out. And very often it happened that I would just uh, be done with what I'm doing. Julia and I would have been speaking across the day, but I need to talk to her and it's bedtime for her. And there's a phone in my hand, there's data in my hand, but the reality is the people in my life are no longer available to talk to me. And that's big deal, absolute big deal. I'll give you another example. The one that particularly got to me very seriously. Am I telling secrets? Yes, I am. Okay, so um, we had the hangout a few days ago in Houston, and I am used to, after the event, talking with my wife about the event, thanking God, just being together. I mean, just being happy together at what the Lord had done or has done. Um, and here I was, hang out over, met with a few persons. Julia managed to stay up a little late to just have conversation with me and she was gone. Absolutely gone because she needed to sleep. The next day was church. She was going to be in church. All right. And we had a couple of things to do even after church for her back in Nigeria. And here's the deal. I am back for the first time in my life. Um, even when we travel or I travel alone, there's still some kind of uh, we've never had it this way. I'm going somewhere with these stories, so stay with me. All right, and so here was I all alone in the house where I stay. Nobody to talk to, absolutely nobody to talk to. That's a modern day reality, all right? Um, back in the day, I've heard stories of people and I experienced that a bit where people write love letters and expect it two months later, all right, so it takes a circle of four to five months, you know, to exchange basic love communication. But today people get angry because your WhatsApp message was not replied in five, in two minutes, in fact, one minute. All right, you're already checking time. You read my message at nine. You're only replying me at 9.07 and there's already crisis in the relationship. Why did I give all of these stories? Number one pitfall in this generation is that our desire for company is heightened is greatly heightened. We no longer know what it means to be alone and be fine. And it's a big deal. So you have people pressuring for relationship or pressuring for marriage, not because they understand the purpose of marriage or why they are going in. So the why is totally lost for most people in this generation because our desire for company is heightened. And your desire for company is not as originally ordained by God. An average modern person is extremely more altered than they think. You are greatly altered. I am sorry to say it that way. All right. But it's the truth. Just like when you go into robotics and AI, you see, we're so used to alteration. Do you see everybody throwing out their AI pictures? I mean, every other person you know is throwing out an AI picture. And I was looking at that just recently and I wondered, do people really have self-confidence? Do people really like how they look or people really want to change who they are? People really want to feel a different sense of things and people are jumping on every trend. I've not just criticized you, I'm sorry. I don't mean any harm. All right, but let me say this, just like I speak of makeup, when it comes to some of these things that trend and people jump onto, is a reflection of their dissatisfaction with who they are, how they are, and where they are. 
All right, so we're dealing with a generation where people do not know how to be alone and be fine. And you have been crafted into this space, just like, you know, they make robots and, you know, they control machines. Humans are within a control realm that we don't even know today. Because just check your life, for instance. Look at the number of social media platforms you subscribe to. An average person listening to me is subscribed on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Telegram, YouTube, Threads, uh, Twitter, and every kind of so TikTok and every kind of social media platform you can think about. If you really want to understand what I'm saying, go to your phone and check the settings of how many minutes or hours a day you spend on all of these platforms. The report can be quite damning. It tells you that you have a soul connection to things that you did not know how deep you were connected to. And it's not just because of those things you want to be in touch. How many times have you gone to Facebook just scrolling through, hoping that you stumble upon something interesting? Not because you went there with any type of purpose, but because you wanted to be entertained, you wanted to feel connected. How many times have you picked up your phone and you just hoped that somebody left you a message on WhatsApp and you feel disappointed because you stumbled on that platform and there was no message waiting for you? Because there's something about us that has been altered and we want company all the time. I don't want to preach a very deep sermon here today and get into how much that impacts on our spiritual life and the depth of who we are supposed to be and how far we are supposed to go in God. But yeah, let me just mention it by the way that that's the reason why a lot of us are no longer deep with God and for the things of God and the assignments he has given us. All right, let's come back to the subject. We're still dealing with relationship. All right, so it's a pitfall. So that every single person listening to me needs to first of all realize that I may not be in relationship or have a knack for relationship because I know the purpose of relationship, but because I haven't handled being alone. And I'm going to give you scripture uh, to back up what I'm saying. I'm properly trained teacher of the word of God, all right? So uh, I, I don't know how to give opinion without getting into scripture. All right, and some of the things I'm going to say I mean, you are too well acquainted with it. You have a teacher for a father, so... I mean, come on, let's do it. So, uh, <laughs> just, I mean, you, you may just even look at me like, what is he saying? It may be too shallow for you, actually. But let's go there. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God begins to cast a manifesto of the things he wanted to do with the earth and mankind. He begins to declare like a politician, let us make man an image after our likeness, because God does not do things without, first of all, casting, uh, you know, a picture of what he wants to do. He does that to bind himself to the things he has said and to leave a reference point for all of creation to know that he followed through on his plan. So he began to say, let us make man an image after our likeness and let him have dominion and all the things that he said. In Genesis uh, 1, the next thing he does was to now bring into reality the things he had said. But this was spiritual reality, not manifest reality, because Adam and Eve were not on earth. So you see that he created man and um, woman, uh, that's mankind, male and female, created he them uh, in his image. All right, in verse 28, God does what God does best, and is to bless anything that is made or anything that is manifested in accordance to his will. So he repeats verse 26 in the blessing. So he blessed them to be fruitful and multiply. In essence, he commanded them to become the things he had proposed for them to be. All right. So in Genesis chapter 2, something profound now happens. So he first manifests the man. It's just like when a company comes up with a prototype vehicle and they don't produce it all immediately. And they produce perhaps 2,000 of them and produce more later. So it was not because Eve was an afterthought. And that's a message to some sisters listening to me. I know you feel like you're waited and you're waited and you're waited and you're waited. You're actually not looking for a husband that doesn't exist. The guy exists. The guy is not just yet in your life. All right. So Adam was first manifested alone because God wanted to make sure that Adam understood the concept of being alone. Marriages are frustrated today because people do not know how to be alone because nobody can actually take away your loneliness i mean this was re-emphasized by a message by daddy that i listened to uh, quite recently all right nobody can take away your loneliness if you don't know how to handle the vacuum that must exist outside of your spouse i mean there are numerous vacuums in your life that you need to 100 percent be able to function in outside of your partner so today, because of that knack for company, we have frustrated spouses or people frustrated in a relationship because you are dating a person or married to a person that you think can be there 247 and they just cannot be there 247. And that's why I teach single people to say that 
if the person you are dating creates an impression like you are the most important and only important thing in their life, run for your life because they are putting a burden on you you cannot carry. You guys are going to go to work. You guys are going to go travel. You guys are going to have a career. You guys are going to have passions that will not necessarily bind you, but which you will permit to happen in your joint life because it's a part of the curriculum where you don't necessarily need to participate in all the stages, all the phases, and every aspect of it. Even when Jesus was going to go into Gethsemane, you know what he did. Out of the 12, he took three. Even the three had a boundary line where he kept them. He expected them to be with him, but he didn't expect them to go all the way with him into the realms that he went to because there's a place that is actually meant for you alone. So what am I saying? There's that vacuum that Adam had and Adam filled the vacuum with what God wanted him to fill it with. See, watch what happened here. The first thing God did was to begin to instruct him. Read from Genesis chapter 2 from verse 15. God begins to instruct him. So you have a lot of people now who are not instructable by the Lord because all they want is a relationship. So God cannot isolate them to speak to them at all. It's a modern pitfall. Why? The very relationship that they need to come into and run properly cannot stand on a foundation without instruction. So God is seeking the singles he can speak to about their future, about their spouses, and give them direction about life, but he can find them. Why? Rather than stay with him and take instruction, they're out there looking for a spouse. Rather than stay with him and take instruction, they're out there being desperate and they're married. Rather than stay with him and take instruction, they're out there wondering what's going on with me. Nothing is going on with you. He first isolated Adam to give him instruction. So he begins to speak to Adam. He begins to speak to Adam. And indeed, speaking to the men in particular, if God cannot instruct you, how can you lead a home? Because even the failure of Adam is tied to the failure of passing instruction to his household. Don't forget in Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent came to Eve, the serpent began to confuse Eve and Eve didn't get the curriculum. And when you travel to the New Testament, you see why I can boldly say that Eve did not receive the fullness of the curriculum because the woman was deceived. You don't deceive a person who knows. You don't deceive a person who has become one with the knowing. So Adam comes in and what happens? Adam rebelled because Adam knew the truth that he had not communicated. So rather than Adam save the woman and become the redeemer of the woman and say, you know, or what you did is wrong. That's not according to God's standard. He beat the fruit too. That's not my subject. Let's keep that aside. Let's go back to where Adam was instructed. So the Lord God began to speak to him. The Bible said that the Lord God warned him, all right, that of every tree in the garden, he should eat but that one. He should not eat it. All right, God, God gave him that instruction and God gave him assignment. It was in verse 18 that God, having observed and come to the conclusion that you see Adam, you got the instruction. You know what it means to be alone and be fine. That God now said to him, it's not good that man be alone, not lonely. Two different things. It's not good that this guy be alone at this time. Why? Now, if you read in some translation like the Amplified and the Message Translation, it talks about bringing a partner that is a help comparable to him. God begins to reveal to him a part of him and the destiny he's given them, the assignment he's given them that requires help. Adam was not desperate. Adam was not concerned. Adam was not bothered. Adam actually felt perfectly in shape because he was busied out by the things he was supposed to do. You know, today we meet a lot of single people who think that their destiny only begins after they get married. That's a distraction in itself because this uh, generation um, has elevated uh, the concept of relationship and giving it a place that it does not have. Because relationship is not an end in itself. Every relationship is a conduit for a purpose. I'm going to repeat that. Every relationship is a conduit pipe for a purpose. It must carry something. And I jokingly always say this. Do you know why some couples fight, quarrel, keep malice for weeks? Because they are not fulfilling purpose. They have too much energy to give. They need to use their energy for something. So you are dating a guy out of three years of relationship. Your cumulative time of keeping malice is actually two and a half years. You have just managed six months of actual relationship because you don't know what you are doing together. And let me say this to you. If you don't know how to handle your alone time, you will not know how to handle your relationship time because your alone time is what lays the foundation for how you handle relationship. What you are busy out becoming in your alone time is actually what you deploy when you come into the relationship time. So 
the best person to meet and be in relationship with is someone who knows exactly where they are going to so that the burden doesn't come on both of you. Have you ever been called by a person who had nothing to say to you and they just ask, good morning, good afternoon, what have you eaten? Are you home? Are you lying down? Are you in bed? Are you going to the toilet? You know, it becomes boring because life can't be about both of you. Go back to the Adam and Eve story. Life was not about them. It began with the manifesto of God in Genesis 1.26. Con con continue to when God, you know, created them. Went on onto the blessing in verse 28. Comes into Genesis chapter 2 from verse 15 where God begins to instruct the man. All of this was not about them. The little bit of it that was about them is in Genesis 2.18 where he says it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make for him. No, so he begins to deal with the aloneness and takes him quickly back to purpose to say I'll make a helper for him, helping him to do what? That's the question he must ask. It's still not about us. Just like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, all things were made for his glory. They are and well created. That verse that becomes a song for us. All things well. Am I forgetting the song? They are and well created. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou created all things are for thy pleasure. They are and well created. See, it's so clear why he made everything. There's nothing that's about me. There's nothing that's about you. All right, we only receive it as the blessedness of his purpose. So when I enjoy stuff, it's not because it's about me. He didn't make it about us. It's about him. But here's the deal. This generation makes it about us. It makes it about wanting to feel good. It makes it about not being alone. It makes it about, you know, it, it, it's amazing how we have missed it that much. So if we want to get it right, we need to go back to the point where we are dealing with these concepts as a concept of him and his process for us, which includes being alone and being fine because our alone time is not a wasted time. It's a time that we deploy on the things that we need to do to stay in the loop of his instructions to us. But guess what God did? And this is the amazing thing about God. But God is, because God is never in a rush like we are. Never. He never will be. So I'm going to tell you exactly what God did. So in verse 18, God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. Wouldn't you think that in the very next verse, he would just bring him a wife? No. The thing he saw next in verse 19 were animals. He began to see goats and oaks and vultures, donkeys. Then Adam began to name. I didn't even realize early on that God was putting him through a test of the picture. Because when God gives you a picture and you are able to beat this modern trend of desperation to be in relationship, you are going to learn to reject what does not line up with the picture. Because what begins to happen here is that when the animals came, Adam couldn't see the picture, so he named them according to the visions he could see. All right, so Adam gave them nature and naming. Then in verse 21 or so, God, you know, comes to the conclusion with Adam that none of these animals he had named was suitable. So Adam was checking for suitability, not for companionship. Did you get that? The package. But Adam was not just seeking for, I want to be with someone. I don't want to be alone. Where is my missing rib? I am looking for somebody. Adam was looking for suitability. None was suitable to his destiny. But how do you come to the conclusion that something is suitable or not when you don't even know and haven't practiced into the direction of your destiny? That's the test that Adam, you know, passed. So that's when God put him to sleep and brought the woman. You see, Adam beat the things that we're not beating today. We're too distracted, seeking, searching for company. So we are too, we are too invested in wanting company. Number two thing with the modern age, I think I'll share about three. three. So number two. Number two thing with the modern age is that we also are in a generation that have not laid hold on the purpose of marriage or the why of marriage. All right. So we are responding to the need to be married through 
diverse but very, very wrong reasons. Number one, for example, people get married because they have come of age. Marriage is not about age. Yeah, we encourage people to get married as soon as they can, but with a caveat, they should have a purpose, all right, that defines why they are going in. Because you have a lot of people who are old enough but not wise enough, if you want to understand what I'm saying. Read um, in Matthew 19 from verse number 10, 10 and 11 precisely, 10 to 12. Um, read it in the message translation. It just makes it easy. I mean, the commentary is good. It just makes it so easy. Marriage is not for everyone. Some people are not equipped for it. They are just old enough for it. All right. We also have the issue where people just finish school and it looks like the next thing that must happen is marriage. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. That's why I've married out a lot of novices who have no business being in marriage. Because marriage is serious business. Marriage is not just about age, finishing school, uh, hormones. I mean, all of these things that dictate marriage today is a modern problem. All right, so we are under so much pressure because we want to give status. Some of us are even getting married because our mothers wanted grandchildren. It's not about grandchildren. I mean, that's the honest truth. Marriage is not about a lot of things that we talk about today. And that's why I'm glad that Triple H happens. I mean, you need to learn into marriage. Why do you need to learn into marriage? It's the most central institution to everybody's manifestation of their callings in life. That's the truth. Except for those who, like the Bible identifies, for the sake of the kingdom, have decided not to be married. You see, it's all about kingdom. So if I'm going in, it's central. If I'm not going in, then I'm not going in. But the moment I go in is the most central institution. And let me quickly say this, why you need to dig into the meaning of marriage and not just fall for, you know, the craze for marriage in this age, the pressure just to be married. Why, 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 do, you have to, uh, why do you have to get perspective into it? Because you're actually going to be frustrated if you don't go in knowing what to do. And that's why people don't know how to treat each other. Because they don't even know what they're doing inside. That's the honest truth. So you see people get married and are shocked. What am I doing in your life? You are doing what you came to do. But what, when what you have come to do is not something that is wholesome within the context of the meaning of marriage, then you're in trouble. All right? So it's so important. And you know part of why it's such a pressure in this generation? We're in a show generation. People want to put picture and say couple goals. You know, I have, I've, I've heard of and I think I remember experiencing people putting couple goals and months later they are divorced. You know, you see, it's, it's about show. We're in that show generation. So one of, the, one of the dominant reasons why there's such pressure to be married is that it's not about the purpose of marriage. It's more about putting up a show. It's more about breaking the internet. It's more about putting something for the ground. You know, and that's why I, I once told some people uh, while I was teaching, I said that uh, God forbid the day that my marriage is better on social media than, it's better on ho that, than it is at home because the most important thing about my marriage should be what happens at home and not the impressions that you have. So we live in that impression generation. We want to make an impression. We want to, you know, put out an image, have a uh, uh, give people a perspective of what is not necessarily true. So all of those distractions, you know, uh, makes it very difficult for people to go into the meaning, all right, of marriage. And let me say this to you because I just don't want to highlight problems and not deal with the answers, is that you must go back into the Word of God and reschool yourself as to the purpose of marriage. Because like my Monroe of Blessed Memory will say, until the purpose of a thing is known, abuse is inevitable. So you want to make sure you are not abusing the institution of marriage, but practicing marriage for what marriage is. All right, number three point, we should have been number one because that's the worst thing plaguing marriages or relationships uh, as a modern trend is that there is toxic wisdom out here. Absolutely. I do not think there is another generation where guard your heart with all diligence for it determines the course of your life is a more apt scripture than this generation. I do not think so. This is the generation, I mean, you hear all manner of things. Do you realize that relationship teachers are bound today? If I let's be honest, when I began to sense the calling of the Lord to focus and emphasize these things, I was a bit ashamed to identify uh, with teaching uh, emphasis on relationship and marriage. I was. Because everywhere I turn to today, it seems everybody is called to talk about it. Not from a perspective of threat. Absolutely. The space is too large to be threatened. There are too many people needing help to be threatened. 
So this is not about trying to keep it narrow and keep it uh, small so that I can feel relevant. No. It is that the falsehood out there, the actual toxic madness out here is sickening. Like I'm tired. Very tired of the nonsense you hear. You just turn on every page on Instagram. Everybody wants to be a relationship teacher. Facebook, social media, gathering people everywhere teaching total nonsense. It's a plague of this age. And guess what? They're on your phone. They're on your social media platform. Bloggers everywhere. You just have false nonsense, doctrine, heresies, and destructive wisdom. Now, here's the deal. Things may sound wise but may never be wise. When you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I had not come with enticing words of man's wisdom. I decided to keep it simple and focus on Jesus and him crucified. He said, because I did not want your faith to rest in the wisdom of man, but in the wisdom of God. Because everything you hear will determine where your belief will rest. So he said, I did not want your faith. It's about your faith eventually. He said, that's why I came to you with the gospel, with the demonstration of the spirit and of power. We live in an age where what you teach may actually not make sense, but will make spirit. So there's falsehood everywhere. You need to see what you listen to. You need to audit who can have your attention. That's the world in which we live today. Because destruction is actually passed through instruction. That's what it is. If you are not instructed by a system, that system cannot destroy or make you. All right? So let me just put it in quotable quotes. Destruction or construction is true instruction. So I need to choose. It's like, choose you this day whom you will serve. I said before you, life and death. Choose one. Choose life that you may live. All right? So you want to be careful. You want to be careful. And guess what? Many of them sound fantastic. Oh, many of them sound fantastic. Especially for us in Nigeria who are quite open to white man's religion, in quotes. I find people who say that about Christianity. It's not white man's religion. It's Jesus Christ that died for us. But you know what I call white man's religion? The mad trends that America and other nations of the earth who have influence pass to us because they have platform. Truth is not validated by the number of following. So we have a lot of people from the West who have large following and command great attention, who throw lies at us, and people just embrace it because it's from so-so and so. Let me say something to you about the health of your faith. If you cannot question conversations and revelations and doctrines of people who are quite popular and widely embraced, if nothing ever kicks in your spirit, that's not true. That's not balance. If you don't bury in the system and go back to the word, there's something wrong with your growth. So you see this age? We are at war. I don't even know how many minutes I have spent, but I think I'll just keep it here and wrap it up here. Um, if you forget anything I said today, we are at war. I really hope you enjoy the rest of the Sunday uh, with everything going on uh, in this triple H Sunday. I love you. Uchelio Kutepa is my name. Keep strong and don't forget, we are at war. God bless you.